Everybody got quiet. I guess that's my cue. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, I am Victor Davila. I'm the director of the Global Health Center at the Institute for Public Health at Washington University, which is sponsored by both the IPH and the Department of Medicine. This week, we celebrate the ninth annual Global Health Week at WashU, a university-wide initiative organized by the Global Health Center to foster university-wide engagement in global health activities. Today's Internal Medicine Grand Rounds is one of those activities. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Margaret Molly McNary. She's currently an Associate Professor of Medicine at Will Cornell Medicine. She's also Director of the Center for Global Health, Director of the Will Cornell Global Health Research Fellowship, and Chief of the Division of Hospital Medicine at Will Cornell Medicine. She attends in the hospital medicine service at New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Dr. McNary completed her graduate degree from the University of North Carolina and subsequently received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School, which was followed by training in internal medicine and a fellowship in global health, both from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. While in medical school, she completed a master's degree in health economics and policy at the London School of Economics and the London School of Tropical Medi Medicine throughout uh, through a Fulbright scholarship. She is an internationally recognized physician scientist with over 20 years of experience as a frontline doctor and public and global health researcher. Her research focuses on the areas of HIV, and cardiovascular disease, epidemiology, and clinical trials and implementation sciences, all with the overarching goal of improving health among vulnerable populations, both in the US and globally. Her work has been funded by several NIH institutes, including the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Also, she has received funding from the CDC, the Gates Foundation, and other organizations and foundations. She has received awards for leadership and mentorship, where she has been particularly active in mentoring young women physician scientists. She lives in New York City with her husband and three young children. It is indeed a great pleasure to have Dr. Molly McNary present at today's Medicine Grand Rounds during Global Health Week. The title of her talk is Cardiovascular Disease in Haiti, the use of applied epidemi epidemiology to target interventions to curb the epidemic. Molly, welcome to Washington University. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you for that really kind, generous um, introduction. Here are my disclosures. And let's get started. So I have more to tell you than I have time to tell you. I speak fast. I'm from the South. And um, so we're going to cover a lot. Um, and I'm hopefully my goal is to get you excited about um, cardiovascular disease in global settings. We're going to start by talking about the global burden of cardiovascular disease and do a, sort of a focus of knowledge gaps in particularly low-income countries. And then I want to shift to talk about Haiti as a case study. Um, for how you use research as a tool to understand your local epidemic. Um, sorry about that. That may be a theme of this, this slide deck. Just to understand your local epidemic and then use that research to develop local pragmatic high impact interventions. I'm going to use two studies. Uh, the first is an epidemiologic cohort, the CDB cohort study. And the second is an RCT that we're really excited about around HIV and hypertension. So global cardiovascular disease, and, you know, in my lifetime um, and in many of the trainees' lifetime, we sort of switched from the number one cause of global mortali mortality and morbidity is cardiovascular disease. Um, and 32% of all global deaths in 2019 were from CVD, which is a staggering 18 million and climbing. And this is a global map, which it shows the delta of age standardized CV deaths in the last decade with red being the, the biggest um, jumps. So interestingly, 80% of global CVD is um, hypothesized to be in low and middle income countries. And I love this graph because you can see middle and low income countries, the biggest bar is gold 
And gold is cardiovascular diseases. And these are the, the, the percentage of projected deaths from CVD. And you can see that the gold is just much, much higher in middle and low income countries compared to high income countries. And it's increasing over time from 2000 uh, map to 2030. So the global assumption is that ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of cardiovascular death and, um, and the, the most common cardiovascular disease. And this is data pulled from what's called the Global Burden of Disease Project, which is an incredible Herculean project um, in Seattle where they pull um, all cohort data from across the world. And the majority though is from high income countries because it takes a lot of resources to get cohort data. And so on one hand, um, this, uh, assumption is reasonable. It's the case for the U.S. for ischemic heart disease. And if you think about lower or, or middle income countries westernizing, um, you know, increasing their GDP and the lifestyle changes of poor diet, uh, obesity, diabetes, smoking, maybe there is this westernization of the um, of these uh, uh, behavioral health um, issues in sort of middle income countries like pockets of China or pockets of South Africa. And indeed, ischemic heart disease um, you know, phenotype. But on the other hand, in Haiti, a place with extreme poverty, like omnipresent poverty, we're not seeing ischemic heart disease anecdotally. And so the big question mark today is, you know, is this the path, is this a story in low-income countries? And, the, and it may be, but it may not be, and we need to find out. More CBD risk factors in low-income countries are less clear than they are in high-income countries. So this is data from Gene Kwan, again, aggregated data across some cohorts. And what you learn to focus on is that in the gray bar, you know, 30 to 45 percent of um, risk factors in these low-income countries are just not known. And so, again, the question mark is, what are they? Because we need to know them in order to intervene upon them. I added this because it's fresh data from New England Journal. It's October 5th, and this is a fantastic study um, that includes just tons of people. So, 112 cohorts. Think about it: 34 countries, 1.5 million people. And the message here was that there are five modifiable CBD risk factors. They're not, you know, they're as expected. Obesity, systolic blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, and diabetes. And they're responsible for around 54% of all global um, CBD um, death and, death and morbidity. Okay, so great news. That means that we could potentially, if they're modifiable, reduce them and prevent that suffering. But, but on the other hand, if you look in the charts, only 10,000 patients came from sub-Saharan Africa and really low-income countries. So again, like this question mark of, you know, is this the case um, for low-income countries? And I would say to be determined and let's determine it together. Ultimately, CBD epidemiology, meaning the prevalence of diseases, the incidence of diseases, the age of onset, the progression, the risk factors, the social determinants of health are defined in populations by large cardiovascular um, epidemiologic cohort studies. There are many examples in the U.S., and these are several, and they range from focusing on like regards in the lower corner, um, geographic and racial differences in CVD, to cardia, which was a seminal study looking at early onset of CVD risk factors in the life course. And together, these provide like a, a treasure trove of data for us to unpack, you know, high risk populations, modifiable risk factors, and using this data to inform interventions. So I try to convince you that we need similar studies for low-income countries. Okay, we're doing, a, we're doing a pivot. Now we're going to Haiti. So Haiti is a very small country in the Caribbean. It has 11 million people. The majority live in Port-au-Prince and the majority live in severe poverty. So just think about it, $2 a day. Our coffee today was probably $3.50. $2 a day is the threshold for the World Bank for, um, for severe poverty. Um, Haiti is a country of extremes. On the one hand, it's the first black nation to gain independence in 1804. And when I tell my children that, I mean, you know, U.S., that we're, that's only like 25 years after the U.S. Um, but on the other hand, it's had, you know, centuries of economic and political isolation that have led to massive debt and uh, fragile um, state systems. More in the past 15 years, um, they've just suffered, you know, a relentless barrage of um, natural disasters, including the earthquake, the cholera epidemic, and ongoing political instability. This is the earthquake near our site in 2010. And you know now that Haiti is in the news for its ongoing humanitarian crises. The president was assassinated in 2021, um, and just right now things are very um, unstable. So I acknowledge the instability um, and acknowledge that it's extremely challenging to work in Haiti. 
but nevertheless, we persist and we do, and we are able to keep our clinics open and to conduct NIH funded research. And so how is this, how is this possible? It's because of uh, Dr. Bill Pop, who founded uh, JESPIO and the very, very deep community bonds that we have with the um, communities that we serve. Okay, so JESPIO, what does that mean? That is a Haitian acronym, or sorry, a French acronym um, for uh, the Haitian group for the study of Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections. And the clinic was named that um, in 1982 when it was founded because we didn't use the word AIDS and HIV. It's the first AIDS clinic in the world historically, and it's the largest um, clinic in the Latin American Caribbean region. Um, it has a 40 year partnership of uninterrupted clinical care and NIH funding um, and deep partnerships with the Ministry of Health, Haitian physicians in the community. The mission's threefold, excellent high quality care for every Haitian that we serve, um, training and capacity building so that we're sustainable. And then what I would say is actionable research. So not research just to do research and like move us through the system. Research that answers questions that are directly related to the suffering that um, the group is seeing in the field. And the impact has been phenomenal. So I started off as an HIV clinic, but they've expanded to TB, cholera, malnutrition, and now the, the goal is CVD. And to give you an example of like what that looks like in action, and this makes it look really simple and it's like a lot of work behind this, but this is sort of the story or one of the stories around some of their HIV successes. So they published early on that um, providing antiretroviral treatment for HIV patients in Haiti, right? Like no one says you can do it. You can do it with high, um, with, with good clinical outcomes. So that was the, the first publication um, or one of the first publications in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then a series of um, high quality, rigorous clinical trials showing that we had to initiate ART earlier. And like your generation knows, right? We used to start at 200, 350, 500, and now it's test for treat for all. And, and, and these guidelines impacted not only the Haitian Ministry of Health, but Haiti was able to sort of be the signal on the hill um, for the WHO um, to move their guidelines faster. So our goal is to do this for CBD. Okay, so how do we get to CBD? So I joined um, Cornell, I was recruited uh, maybe-ish nine years ago for HIV work that I had done in Africa and I'd lived in Africa for, for several years. And when I got there, um, Dr. Pop and all of us were like, well, all of our HIV patients are doing quite well. They're virally suppressed and things seem good, but everybody has like outrageous hypertension, early onset stroke, lots of deaths from CVD. Huh, okay, this is not feeling good. And the literature was you know, emerging from the US about this HIV CVD comorbidity um, epidemic. And then second, we have a primary care clinic at JESPIO and there's just massive early onset cardiovascular disease. So at the same time, the global burden of disease, that group I was telling you about, had, has projections for every country. And in Haiti, there is no data. So they, they say on the, you know, in the, um, the fine print, this data is extrapolated from other countries and we're just kind of giving you our best guess, but at least it's a guess. And they were saying there's this epidemiologic shift that's happening in Haiti where HIV used to be our number one public health problem. And now it looks like cardiovascular disease. This is also data from that group. Here, it's just a bucket of all the causes of death in, in Haitians greater than 20. Again, modeling studies. And everything in blue is a death from non-communicable disease. Everything in red is a death from communicable diseases, and then in green is other. And what you can see here is like, oh my gosh, the biggest box is cardiovascular disease. Um, second, um, compared to HIV, it's, uh, which, which is attributed to 5.6% of deaths. More, I just want to underscore the, clini the clinical CBD care in Haiti is very lean. There's only 17 cardiologists for 11 million people, you know, plus or minus. And so the knowledge gaps at this time, as a general internist, Dr. Fraser's like, how, you know, the background of how you get involved in this is like, well, what, what's the accurate local data? And more like, what are, what's even modifiable? Can we modify any of this? And then the third is like, I'm a clinician more than I'm a researcher and I want to use data to intervene, right? And that's what you as trainees should be thinking about. Like the data, when we look at data, it's all about using it to intervene. So this is just a picture also for the trainees to say, well, like, what does it look like? You know, I can talk about this and it sounds so like remote, but this is a room where a friend took this picture. This is Dr. Pop at his desk, Dr. Dan Fitzgerald with his hand like this. He's the, our director of the Center for Global Health. And this is us talking about like, look, we're an HIV institution and we need to pivot. We, not pivot, we need to expand. And so how do we start? Well, you don't start with a beautiful NIH study. You start with a very small study um, when you are trying to just begin. And so this is a study that was an NIH Fogarty capacity building grant. Um, and it's my first CBD study. And so what we did is um, Jeff Bio is in blue and across the street are the largest slums in Port-au-Prince. 
And we um, work with demographers to develop sort of a, a framework to get a random sample. And each of those points on that map is a GPS point for a household. And it's about 500 households that we knocked on the door and we said, we wanna learn about cardiovascular disease and non-communicable diseases. Can we, can we randomize two, two adults in your household? And we asked a lot of uh, questionnaires that use sort of standard questions from the WHO about CVD. Um, we also asked about stress um, and we measured blood pressure. Now, measuring blood pressure, you can measure it and it's garbage in, garbage out, or you can measure it the right way. And there's been a lot of literature for those of you who are in the cardiology field of like, what is the right way to measure blood pressure so that we can both compare blood pressure across trials and that we trust that blood pressure. And I'll just say, I would call it a research grade blood pressure. And it, it's the right cup, it's the right cuff size, it's the right weighting, it's multiple measures and it's averaging of some of those measures. And we did that in the slums of Haiti. And you can see um, some of the field workers crossing um, sort of these, th these swampy areas to get to the right GPS point um, and the, the team measuring blood pressure. Um, and we measured these risk factors. And so I'm not gonna show you all the results. Hypertension was age standardized prevalence was around 28%, which yeah, felt like ex expected it was high. But the, the, the like signal that got us all sort of worried and excited was that among 18 to 30 year olds, so that's very young people, they should not have high blood pressure, right? None of you, all of you are young in the audience, you should not have high blood pressure yet. 12.3% um, had it in their cohort. And so to compare that to, you wanna compare it to like, is that normal for other black populations? And so the only data we have to compare that to, because most people don't take blood pressure, research grade blood pressures in these groups and other settings is historical data. So it's not temporally the same, but there are two cohorts, Cardia um, that specifically looked at black Americans who were young and in Haines, which is a national cross-sectional study that um, has uh, black Americans. Um, and we found that, wow. So compared to rates of blood pressure among 18 to 30 year old black Americans, Haiti is what, at least twofold, maybe more fourfold higher for hypertension, but our other risk factors were, were the similarly you know, decreased. So huh, we have this hypertension, we don't have these other risk factors, why? And, you know, when you start sort of think, you know, you get a signal, you've got to sort of build out your conceptual model of like, what other information do we need to know? And so this is very simple, but, you know, working in Haiti, you're like, okay, there's got to be poverty related social and environmental determinants that are, that are associated, or maybe we can establish causality with CBD risk factors. Um, and those risk factors didn't go on if untreated or even partially treated or, uh, to, to cause diseases, or these determinants are directly causing disease. And this, this bucket of poverty-related social determinants, we really wanted to do a deep dive on. And we, we really wanted to, to add things that are not on the normal list in the US, like pollution, food insecurity, and sort of this mass, the sense of extreme poverty related to, to stress. Okay, so we birthed the study. So in 2018, we were lucky enough to get an R01, um, which is uh, called the Haiti CBD cohort study. And it's really set up to be like Haiti's Framingham or Haiti's, um, um, you know, the Cardia study. Um, it includes 3,000 adults age 18 and up. Traditionally, CBD cohorts like to look at 40 and up because you're just going to have more events, but we really wanted to focus on the young people. So 18 and up. And we enrolled them and they came to Jeskio. And every year they come to Jeskio for a study visit. And then we have a whole team of field workers who goes to them every six months to um, do blood pressure measurements, uh, changes in risk factors, um, and, and screen for incident CVD events. This is the study uh, setting. This is uh, the metropolitan defined region of Port-au-Prince. And you can see Jeskio at the star. And I just wanna tell you about, um, I'm, I'm so proud of this. So I like to brag on this point is that the study is population-based. And you know I didn't understand this until I did a population-based study because we kind of toss that outward maybe. Um, what it means is that it's not a clinic-based study. So we're not just taking people who make it to our to the clinic because that's a, that's a, a non-generalizable sample. It's not a study where you just say, come here, I need to recruit you, you come and you get that sample of people. You go to great pains to randomly find people um, within enumerated areas. And so what you see here is the Haitian um, Institute of Statistics doesn't have census tracts, but they have what's called enumerated blocks, which each block here represents around 100 to 200 residential households. I'm not saying it's perfect, but at least it's a grid to start. 
And so we didn't have enough resources to go to all the blocks. So we just randomly chose a hundred. They're color coordinated based on our field worker team assignments. So they're just regionalized. And then when in each block, you use software to assign GPS points and the number of GPS points are, um, are, are, are distributed based on the number of households expected to be there based on the census tract. And then you send a field worker teams with little GPS points out into the from a door and say, please um, participate in the study. And then you get a roster of everybody who lives there and then you randomly recruit from that. So it's like this, these layers and layers to tell you that the 3000 people that we got represent um, the uh, urban um, low income um, setting, specifically Port-au-Prince. Study measures were, it was, it was a long list of study measures because we knew this is our one chance to get to get data um, across multiple fields. So it's health behavior questionnaires that mirror WHO questionnaires and other study questionnaires. So um, it's clinical exam, including that research grade blood pressure, um, CBD imaging, echocardiograms and EKGs, um, laboratory measures, and then we built a, a big biobank. This is just a picture of um, the giants who helped me create the cohort, including um, leading cardiologists in Haiti and um, some epidemiologists who've been involved in large cohort studies. Okay, I, I meant this slide to be busy because I want to prove a point. These are the CBD risk factors we looked for in the diseases, and we went, we, we were adamant that the, the way we defined each risk factor in disease had to be gold standard so that when we reported back to the international community, we have an MI in Haiti, that it would be believed as an MI um, compared to, you know, an MI in cardia. So um, all these definitions are equivalent to, um, or to WHO and AHA definitions. All cardiovascular disease, both prevalent, which is not typical, and incident are adjudicated by committee. Okay, you can't do this in a vacuum though. Remember we're an HIV infectious disease institution and we're sort of expanding to CVD. So I just wanna say that there's a ton, a ton, a ton of gritty work that's fabulous and joy filled but that happens for CBD clinical um, capacity building. We had to find space. We had to train doctors on how to screen for CBD risk factors. We had to educate what risk factors were. We had to build algorithms for blood pressure measurement. We had to create with the Ministry of Health, a first line hypertension regimen, which interesting, they chose amlodipine over diuretics, but we can tell you that story later. And we had to teach people how to do echocardiograms, um, which is you know a feat. Um, and we had to train field workers. We applied for hundreds of grants, and this is just an example of the grant. Um, and I want to say this because sometimes I feel like um, in, in, as juniors, you think like, if I do research, I can't do programmatic capacity building. And I would say that's, um, that's a myth. You have to do both at the same time um, to, to really be as high impact as you can. So this is a Resolve to Save Lives grant around building the national algorithm for hypertension. Okay, so the results. This is your classic table one. So the age of our cohort, um, median is 40, that's quite young. 60% are females, which is actually um, typical of the age sex pyramid of urban Port-au-Prince. They're poor, there's high uh, food insecurity, low rates of smoking, really low rates of um, vegetable and fruit intake re related to food insecurity because they're quite expensive, high reports of dietary salt, high rates of perceived stress. This is a validated score called the perceived stress score. Um, moderate to severe depression was 3.7%. And then we ask um, other variables related to neighborhood violence. Um, and I'll show you some other results um, that was quite high. Okay, this is the results of many papers combined into one with the first author, um, Haitian physicians um, and um, one of our medical students. And um, it, as expected, hypertension is our, our, our most prevalent uh, risk factor. Um, but we do have a fair amount of chronic kidney disease that was higher than expected, um, measured as microalbuminuria um, in the Cadigo framework. And obesity is also higher than we thought, but really uh, it seems to be like a, a sub-epidemic in females. Okay, I wanna switch and talk about exploratory analysis. I'm gonna give you three examples of modifiable factors that we hypothesize be related to hypertension and how we went to, 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 to unpack that. So this is the a medical student's project. It was her thesis and she got high honors for it, which she should have. So let me try to explain it. Haitian said, Molly, 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 it's salt, salt, salt. We just consume so much salt. We can consume between 10 and 30 grams of salt a day. And the, my hypertension experts at Cornell was like, you can't take 30 grams of salt a day. You'll throw up like it's too much. So here's a, here's a Haitian goo, which is the size of a penny. WHO recommends two grams of sodium. Now remember, sodium is not exactly the same measurement as salt. You just multiply it out. But two grams of sodium a day, 
And a low sodium diet, if you have hypertension, heart failure, et cetera, would be less than 1.5 grams of sodium a day. And Haitians are saying that they're having nine times that. The, one of, in our qualitative interviews, the, the number one source is um, these Maggi cubes. You can think of them as like the chicken bouillon cubes. In the South, we had them a lot. <laughs> and they throw like not just one into a, a street vendor's food kettle, but like 20. And the amount of salt in them is extreme. But how am I supposed to measure salt, right? Like, yeah, I, mean, you, I can't. I can't even tell you how much salt was in my breakfast or dinner last night. Like, I don't know. You have to measure it in the urine, and the way you do it is a 24-hour urine collection. Well, I bet you guys are on the wards right now, or not even getting it from your patients. You spill it. You know, it doesn't get to the lab, et cetera, et cetera. So, how the heck are you going to do it in an urban slum? Well, you can't really do it. So, Mark Huffman, I think, put me in touch with the right people to talk about spot urine sodium, and the idea is that you can get a sample, and the timing of the sample is a little bit. Um, controversial, but ideally like two hours, three hours after a meal. And I can't use that. I can measure the sodium just in that sample. And I can't say, okay, Molly, that means it's exactly your sodium, but I can aggregate those sodiums across the population, sort of get an estimate. So Adrian did that for 3000 samples of urine. They got flown back to the U S we had to measure the sodium. We had lots of problems with all of our assays. And we met a physiologist who'd used flame photometry, which is like when you put the sample and the color of the flame represents what it is on the uh, periodic table. And she met sodium. Okay, so what did she find? She found that the mean um, sodium across multiple calculated methods was 3.5 to 5. So just kind of times it by two and, you know, eight to 10 grams of salt. And, but the point is, is like 97% of Haitians are having too much salt. And then in an age stratified analysis, what you can see here is that young people, um, there's a signal of those who have low, the lowest quartile of salt and the highest quartile of salt and SVP, and that signal fades as people get older, but the, in our cohort, age, you know, as age just becomes the dominant uh, variable in these regressions and sort of clouds out or supersedes the signal for other things. Okay, example number two. Um, there's, a, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a long history of um, Haiti being worried about a lead pollution, environmental lead, think like Flint, Michigan on fire. And there's also a very beautiful established literature in the U.S. around um, lead, even at low levels, in law, and elevated BP and incident um, CBD. And in Haiti, um, there's no, you know, F, uh, EPA, and there's um, stories of that the most common practice is taking these car batteries and melting them into cooking pots and cookware. And so. We said in this cohort, we've got to like get it, to try to measure it. And so we used what's called lead care two, which is a point of care test to measure lead. And here, you know, you can only measure lead starting at 3.3. .3. And to be honest, any level of lead is bad and correlations of lead, even like zero to three are awful with CBD outcomes, but we can measure from 3.3 .3 up and just look 71% had detectable lead. And the, the range went up to 45. I mean, like this is like a public health disaster. And you know we don't think of lead um, as a public health disaster in the U.S. Um, anymore after we banned leaded gasoline, but this is still a public health disaster in low-income countries, and this just compares the difference. And this is all work by um, Lily Yan, who's in the audience, who is junior faculty at Cornell, and it, it's just really elegant. And what she found here is a busy slide, but just look at the people who had the lowest quartile of lead in their blood to the highest quartile. There was an association of an increase in SVP and DVP of 2.42 and 1.96. I know what you're thinking in the audience. That didn't matter. It's just two milligrams of two millimeters of mercury of SVP. Like that, I, I don't really care about that. And what I'm trying to tell you, you should care about that. Like if, we, if blood pressure is linear, and if we can move the blood pressure down, um, it matters. And this is adapted from an awesome study that just shows if I show you what would any increase decrease in five millimeters of mercury look like in terms of your hazard ratio for reducing major CBD events, stroke heart failure and cardiovascular death. Okay, third example, then we'll move to trials. Um, I like this one so much. I hope I can explain it simply. The first is <clears throat> we know in the US that there's a poverty continuum and we know that that poverty continuum, we can measure it in terms of social de determinants of health. And we know in the US that those with higher social determinants of health have more CBD outcomes. But in a place like Haiti that's such extreme poverty, First question is, is there, is there heterogeneity in that poverty at this extreme end of the poverty continuum? And the second is, if there is even this faintest of heterogeneity um, uh, in, in poverty and stress and vulnerability, does it relate to CBD outcomes? 
So we copied uh, US methodology and the CDC has this multivariable index that's called the SVI. So it includes not only poverty, but other vulnerable vulnerabilities like housing and number of elderly people you're taking care of and um, all sorts of things, um, stress and perceived social support. And there's wonderful studies in the US that show when you calculate this multivariable SVI for census tracts in the US, top picture, it's asso highly associated with prevalence of CVD. And there's also a dose related response. So this is your SVI quartile, least vulnerable to most vulnerable with hypertension and diabetes. So um, our team worked to create, to adapt this, to create a Haitian SVI. And here, the, and based on the variables that we had available, so the, the big domains are you know, poverty and socioeconomic yeah. status, household co composition, which is things like indoor polluting fuel use, no potable water, poor housing quality, extreme food insecurity, and then stress and well-being. Because this is, you know, living in, in, in this omnipresent poverty, um, there, there's massive amounts of stress um, and uh, negative, you know, emotion related to that, and then um, social support or the lack thereof. And we calculate it for those enumerated areas that I showed you in the front. And this is the results to say that poverty matters. Like, it, even if you're in extreme poverty, this, this, this discrepancy in poverty matters. And here you can see the, the quartiles, um, the same dose related response for hypertension, total CVD, and then heart failure was broken out. Um, in HIV, we've learned that screening for social vulnerabilities makes a difference and that it's not just about the meds that saves lives, but it's about the, the, the social services we can also provide our patients. And maybe this is a signal that says for cardiovascular disease, we've got to start thinking about that too. This is just a breakout that young adults aged less than 45 and females are even more vulnerable to this um, social vulnerability. Okay, spectrum of cardiovascular diseases. This is hot off the press. It's, uh, it, it's well, it's not hot off the press, it's in press. Um, so you're seeing it before other people saw it, but I just we had to share it with you, Lily and I. And um, here's our work on adjudicated uh, prevalent um, CVD. And you can see our point prevalence is 14.7% uh, and heart failure is our most common um, type of heart disease. 80% is heart failure with preserved EF, um, age is young and 31% are on evidence treatment. I love this slide. I'm gonna to try to show you what our point estimates are in pink compared to the global burden of disease estimates for Haiti. Remember there was no data in Haiti, but they still pr project as best as possible and for LMICs. And the first order of business to talk about is that, wow, we have more CVD than they think we have. Problematic, right? And the second is that it looks like heart failure is the dominant subtype. And it sort of challenges the assumption that at least in Haiti, as an example of like a radically low income country, um, ischemic heart disease um, is not the leading um, cause of death uh, or, or cause of CVD, sorry, this is not death, um, but perhaps it's this hypertension and heart failure. Um, I'll skip this, this is just that our ages are very young and this is important to know because young black men, men and women are underrepresented in a lot of the US trials. And so this is giving a signal of like heart failure rates um, in a young black population, at least in Haiti are much, much higher than we um, see. So how can we begin to apply data to develop interventions, right? Cause it's like data's fine but we don't wanna just live in the data land. We wanna do something. So this was work done um, by our team to say that a hypertension care cascade. If you look at the people who have hypertension, who are screened for it, who know they have it, who start any type of med and who are controlled, only 13% of those who have hypertension have controlled BP. Uh, this is the same in many other studies um, in low income countries. So a huge treatment gap and we know what to do to treat it. But the question is how? So um, also with uh, Dr. Yan's um, leadership, we uh, did a pilot and this is the beginning of an implementation science study um, to say, could we deliver communi community-based um, hypertension management to reduce that treatment gap? And this is um, a kind of a busy slide, but I'll just summarize it to say, you've got to talk to people. You can't think you know the answer or read the literature and then be like, I'm an expert. You got to talk to people. So we talk to our patients, we talk to the providers, we talk to the Ministry of Health. And you know, there's lots of frameworks to organize your qualitative interviews. But what we found is that individuals, like hypertension was considered a disease of stress. You take meds when you need it, you don't take it when you don't. In the clinic, there was just limited time. It's a huge, busy public health clinic. But look at this quote. I love the, the second quote. Just give doctors have parts of their hearts that are no longer theirs. Their heart is for the patients. There's this beautiful like trust with our medical system. 
Um, and in the community, you know, I showed you those pictures, like it's a hard place to live in Haiti. It's hard to get transport. It's expensive to get transport. It's hard to get to the clinic um, because of um, political in insecurity. So we knew, and also this is our experience with HIV, we had to decentralize care. We had to do team-based approaches where we brought in community health workers. Um, and this is built on, you know, decades of literature. And um, this is one of Dr. Um, Huffman's papers here. And so the, the, the pilot was pretty simple. It's team-based care. You, um, there's a doctor involved, but there's a lot of health workers who are the, um, the agents in the community. And we had to get, get to patients where they are and not bring them to us. So it was blood pressure in the community using standardized um, methods. It was adapting what's called the WHO HEARTS guidelines for what to tell them to um, counsel around risk reduction. It was decentralizing clinic visits um, and going to their homes and providing the meds to them, uh, doing medication adherence, and also having a protocol for titrating up meds so you didn't have to bring them back. Um, and we only referred patients with uh, signs and symptoms that met sort of thresholds back to the care. And so I'm just gonna show you the data for um, a pilot comparing 100 who got the intervention and 100 who didn't. Um, this is what it looks like. This is one of our health workers. And um, you know, the first thing you have to do is really spend a lot of time adapting these like, not generic, but like kind of protocolized procedures for the community you serve. And they're not written for urban slums, right? So I can't really say just reduce your salt. Most people don't have control over what they eat. Um, so how do you go to the stores and things like that? So this is the intervention, um, and again, you initiate your, your medical regimen at the clinic. You confirm you have hypertension, um, and then everything else is done in the community versus standard of care, where patients have to come to the community on their own accord and their finances every three to six months. And this is the table one, and really the only thing to pay attention to is the groups are similar, and the blood pressure, you know, it's 155s over 90s. You know, it's not tragic, but it's high, and we need it lower. And here are the results. So um, in the intervention, um, here, let's look here. The mean change in SVP and DVP at six months um, was uh, impressive. And more, how many people um, got to a controlled BP under 140 over 90? I mean, we could make it stricter under 120, but um, was remember we were 13% and we got it up to 70% um, compared to 40% in the um, control group. So. Constantly when you're doing small studies or even big RCTs, you've got to make them iterative and you've got to bring in the Ministry of Health and your PAHO partners and your stakeholders early. And this is just an example of we've really tried to build capacity of annually ho hosting these conferences um, where we share the results with the ministry, ask what they feel comfortable with, ask what they don't feel comfortable with, and make it um, a rolling process. Um, and that's part of the fun of global health too. So the next steps of this pilot is that we have submitted it for a large implementation science grant. And what we learned from these um, quotes is that people said like, look, I, I love that you're coming to my house and helping me with hypertension, but like, I wanna give my husband the meds and I'm sharing them with everybody that I'm not telling you I'm sharing the meds with because that's who we are, we're a community. I can't control what I eat. We just basically all, all of us, these households that are sort of like extended family, we eat from the same pot. Um, and um, let's see what else. Um, I want you to be able to tell like my, the, the younger people in our, my family, help them um, because so that we prevent this. And these slides aren't animated right, but there's this concept of a little coup in Haitian society. And the, the cartoon shows you that it's um, it was sort of post uh, plantation era, but that families became, you know, families that weren't biologically related became sort of like an extended social unit. And you share this common courtyard and you share, you pulled your financial resources for help and living, and you provided a ton of social support to each other. So any behavior change really has to happen on that sort of neighborhood or extended family unit. And this is kind of what it looks like in real life. And those of you who work in global health, like th this is not rocket science. This is um, what the, the sort of unit of intervention is. So trying to adapt what we did for individuals to the whole household and capture CBD risk reduction earlier. Okay, last part. Okay. so. My background was HIV, and we know in the literature that HIV increases CBD risk. I don't need to prove the point. You guys all know that it, this is part of um, you know, doctrine now. And you can think of, I always tell my students, you can think of it having HIV as like um, you know, having hypertension or, or diabetes um, in terms of increased risk. And um, this, the second uh, picture is just a, a schematic of the, the plethora of heart disease um, that happens over the course um, of HIV patients' lives, depending on their level of immunosuppression um, 
uh, with heart disease. And so in Haiti, um, we had the lived experience of, you know, early of, of cardiovascular disease among our um, uh, AIDS survivors. And this is just a, I love this study. This is um, my, from my colleague, Rob Peck, which shows we had this pretty famous um, cohort called the Jesco AIDS cohort. And it's the first 1,000 adults who started ART when it first became available in 2004. And um, we followed up, we still follow them, but we followed them for 10 years of this study. And what you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve is that, you know, we think HIV back then, everybody had low BP and we were worried about opportunistic infections, but there, were, there was a handful who had high BP, hypertension at time of ART start. And those who had hypertension and ART start or in red had um, an increased risk of 10 year mortality adjusted for age, sex, CD4 count and other factors with a hazard ratio of 2.5. And a third of those deaths were from stroke. This is um, a KO1 uh, mentee of mine, Lindsay Reef, who's working also to look at you know this this these rates of prehypertension, like think SVP 120s to 139 or DVPs in the 80s, and and just look. A first of all, in HIV negative young adults, it's way too high, but in HIV positive patients, it's like really high. So like the, the, this, we know that hypertension um, occurs earlier and is accelerated. Um, let me skip that. Um, and let me just go to this. So the question we had was, you know, there's been this shift in the threshold for which to start anti-hypertensive pharmacologic therapy um, for subgroups. And US and European guidelines have changed. But for the WHO, um, the guidelines are that um, while they, they suggest that for diabetes and chronic kidney disease, we can lower the threshold to 130, that that HIV, we're still sort of living in like gov ministries of health who are following WHO guidelines. We don't really start thinking about initiating antihypertensive therapy until 140 over 90. And so the, the big question, which you have to start to answer small chunks of it, is if you started um, antihypertensive treatment earlier, could that prevent CVD? Um, so this is a randomized control trial funded by NHLBI and Fogarty. And it looks at early hypertension treatment among persons living with HIV. And um, it is um, a small study um, powered for um, some early events, but not CBD outcomes. So it's sort of the prelim study to a big RCT. And there's 250 people. Um, they're all 18 to 65. They're all virally suppressed. And they all have prehypertension. And they're randomized to early hypertension using the Ministry of Health's first line uh, regimen, which is amlodipine, to start immediately. Um, versus those who um, who wait till they meet the, the threshold of 140. And the primary outcome is difference in mean SVP at 12 months. And secondary outcomes are the proportion who have BP controlled, and this study defined as less than 120, incident hypertension, the safety profile, um, did it influence you know, not taking HIV meds or your viral suppression. This is the baseline characteristics. Um, the age is 50. Uh, people have been on ART for around two and a half years. The regimens are drogatagravir, um, you know, low rates of um, of alcohol and smoking, and then the SVP at start um, sort of is in this this one one twenties to one thirties range. Here are the results. So standard of care is in blue. This is the SVP, and um, the early treatment intervention arm is in yellow. And um, here is the primary outcome of mean change in SVP. Um, and you can see that uh, there was a mean decrease of negative um, 5.9 millimeters of mercury for SVP. And remember that graph I showed you that like two, three, four, five millimeters reduction in SVP is associated with, you know, at 10 years, these reductions in CVD events. And the proportion who had blood pressure control was 57% versus um, 37%. This shocked me, and this is preliminary, and we can do sensitivity analysis around how you define hypertension incidence. But yeah, you know, these people are these are HIV people who have blood pressure think one thirty, and how many develop one forty? You know, in the course of twelve months, I would think like a handful. But our results show that incident hypertension was high in both groups, um, particularly high in the standard of care group. Um, and you know, does this does it's a question mark? I'm not saying it definitively, but does this say like these people are going to develop hypertension anyway? All the more reason to start treatment at a lower threshold to pre to prevent this. Um, in terms of adverse events, um, none were drug related. There were two deaths: one was from TB and one from from a traffic accident. Um, okay, so 
I'm so sorry I speak so fast, but um, that that's what I wanted to share with you today. And I, I really hope you take home that there's this urgent need to know your local epidemiology, be it St. Louis's epidemiology, Haiti's epidemiology, Nigeria's epidemiology. And I, I think that for CBD, it's uh, it, we can't say in a blanket statement that all low-income countries look the same in terms of the spectrum of diseases. And what we found in Haiti, which I'm interested to see if it plays out in other low-income countries, is that there's this massive problem of early onset untreated hypertension occurring early, like in your teenage years, not early. And that heart failure is the largest type of um, a, a subtype of heart disease that we're seeing. And we, we look, uh, an epidemiologic cohort, you do a thousand exploratory studies and we're just starting, but we're seeing pollution is a signal. And the question is, um, what are the sources of this pollution and how do we reduce it? And being bold enough to think that we can reduce it, which I do believe we can. Um, stress and poverty, um, how does that play out in clinical application? This idea of salt and how do you intervene on salt in such a massively impoverished community where it's not like published McDonald's salt, you know, it's you've got to work with street vendors and, and other ideas. And then what are the other modifiable, modifiable factors that we're going to find? The second is um, always think when you do a study, what's the application to clinical context? And um, it will help you design the study better. And it's, it's fun to think about um, in a group. And most global health interventions, you have to have robust community partnerships and let them lead and play a supporting role. And you have to know this is all iterative. Um, the second is that I'm really excited. You know, somebody told me a mentor, like, if you want to be an interventionist, you're only going to have five interventions in your, your life because each one takes five years. And that's, you know, five R01s and then you're old. And so <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, that didn't sound so great. But um, usually there's not like a one, one like wonder, maybe statins was, but I don't know if you can teach me more about what the emerging data is. But it's going to be multi-component interventions, right? You've got to hit hit things on the individual level, the clinic level, and the community level, and combine them, and and test them. I mean, if we just test one little thing at a time, we'll never get there. Um, so I want to leave you with that. And then the second thing is build partnerships. As doctors, we're not great at networking. You've got great networkers here in your Center for Global Health, um, and they're helping me. Um, we're trying to work with your Echo Core Lab to really make a international echo database where we can answer all sorts of questions. Um, and so think about who your networks are and don't be afraid to reach out. I mean, I think Mark and I met through like a cold, like, hello, I'm Molly. I do work in Haiti, help me. Um, and then CBD is the global health epidemic of our time. HIV, there's still so much to be done. I'm not trying to say there's a hierarchy, but CBD, there's so many unanswered questions and we're gonna have the opportunity over the next 20 years to build epidemiologic data sets and really translate into um, to health outcomes. It needs your help. So if you don't know what you were interested in, come meet your faculty who do um, global health. Our team is awesome. I mean, this is why I get up in the morning, not necessarily to write the paper. <laughs> and this is Dr. Pop, who is a global health giant um, and our team. And we're really committed um, in global health to building partnerships where we're elevating our Haitian clinical scientists and nurses and echo techs and data um, experts. And um, we're trying to slow change the culture of global health where there's a first um, or last Haitian author on every paper, which makes us go slower, but it's the right thing to do. Um, and I just can't say enough about the team. Um, it really does take a team and it makes your life more fun. So thank you. And that's it. Questions? Thank you so much, Molly, for a great presentation. I think, uh, you know, in our uh, studies in Africa and uh, other places in South America, we have found not through epidemiologic studies, but certainly through visiting clinics and hospitals and, and, and our, you know, looking at our patients that the prevalence of hypertension in young people is high. And, you know, I often go to the hospitals and do rounds and we see, you know, young young people were admitted to the hospital with heart failure. And we're talking people in their 30s and 40s. So I think the epidemic of heart failure secondary to hypertension, it's it's coming. And a lot of people are not aware of it. And that's really something that we need to work together to achieve better uh, strategies. I also 
say that I'm not saying that all heart failure is from hypertension. We got to do lots more work with rheumatic heart disease and valvular disease and um, infectious disease, cardiomyopathies. But that's, this is part of the picture that we've yeah. got to pay attention to. Yeah. Any questions for Molly, uh, Vicky, please? Yeah, well, okay. So I've never been on a guideline committee and um, yet we were in Haiti and there were no guidelines. So I called up friends of friends and said, before I knew you guys, and I said, who, you know, who, who's run guidelines before? And so we flew down Suzanne Oparil from UAB, Ken Emerson from Michigan, and they helped us with the Ministry of Health set up a guideline committee. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. And um, the idea was, were you going to use um, a diuretic or amlodipine, which both from the WHO say are, are okay to use this first line. And in Haiti, they're the same price. And the Haitian doctors were obsessed with checking labs for the diuretic, even though you're not required to do that. And that seemed as a cost to the health system and also a cost to the patient because you got to come back. And you don't want these patients to come back. Like it's just hard to get to these clinics. Um, and second, there was um, data that, I don't know, Victor, if you can describe it, but in um, the Accomplish trial where um, calcium channel blockers um, seem to work really, really well in black populations. And so I think Haiti was being a little rebellious and said, Let, let's go for it, amlodipine. Um, we have not seen increased in tropical areas. They say amlodipine in women, it's associated with increased lower extremity edema. And we haven't seen that yet. Um, and so far the doctors like it, you know, five, 10, and then move on. Some doctors are still using hydrochlorothiazide and by no means is this flushed out nationally, even though we now have a national guideline. But it is interesting because here, we, I wouldn't say we use amlodipine first line or even sometimes like it. <laughs> uh, Mark, do you have a question? Sure. Thanks, thanks Molly. Yes, thank you. Um, we're glad that you're here. Um, you know, the, the idea about food and the sort of committee uh, and the food and kind of the units that are particularly become, you know, food is social, political, you know, can you just say, when you're thinking about food intervention, can you sort of bring kind of thinking around about how to bring that human that perspective? And I guess um, from a magic perspective, it sounds like you're asking a different kind of people to say, okay, this is the kind of economic strategy. So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that or how to sort of insert questions that also sort of make it clear. Yeah, you got it. You want to repeat the question for the okay. The question is like it's it, it seems so like how are you gonna change food in, in the slum setting of Haiti and this communal food? And um I think Mark's question stems from his like incredible work looking at like big picture pop like sort of more health health system or population ways to start thinking about um changing food. And there's also a whole NIH world now of food as medicine, um, which I'm I'm actively learning and by no means an expert. Um, but yes, like, I, I mean, I want you to come up here and tell them about the potassium, um, salt substitutes, but, um, like, could, could you change, like, it's harder to change health behavior and using Maggie, but can you change the composition of Maggie and working with, um, um, pri private businesses, you know, that, that has been done for HIV and malnutrition with plumpy nut, um, and sort of changing that. So it, th there is like, while it seems like a high mountain to climb, there is precedent for doing that. And I think in CBD, we just have to mobilize, right? Like, so uh, we need your, like we, countries who've done it need to help countries who haven't done it. Um, Cause the first thing everybody says is like, it's too hard huh, and sit back. Um, I, <laughs> and it, sometimes it feels that way. And that's why we have to have a community of this work, but I don't know, like for educational purposes, do you want to talk about some of those stuff? The amount of sodium in the diet is sufficiently high that you can take the diet. So Maggie is a vehicle for sodium that yeah. can be replaced in that way. A lot of times it's used because there's not a lot of flavor in food to be harsh. Yeah. There's a way of having some weight in an otherwise mm -hmm. available. Yeah, diet. yeah, yeah. Anyone? Oh, thank you. Yeah. I've got a comment and a request. 
So my comment is that I was really struck, um, A, by the rates of heart failure and B, by the low rates of guideline-directed medical therapy, which is a world that I'm quite interested in in low and middle-income countries. Um, my request is that I know you've done a lot of really deep work in kind of building communities for women in global health. Do you mind sharing some of that work uh, with our community today? Yeah. Um, okay. This is a bigger topic, but it, I love this topic. Um, it, when you look at um, medical education, people who are going into global health are women. I know there's some giants in the field of global health um, who are also men, but the pipeline of medical students and um, residents and fellows are mostly women. And yet there's this sort of leadership uh, gender gap um, where you look at um, who's at the top of global health leadership, both in ministries of health, you know, in, in um, uh, other countries, but also in our academic institutions and there's men. And so as I was growing up, I'm in my mid forties, there were three assistant professors who were all women and we we're like, huh, like why? Like, well, how, is it really, is it perceived? Is it real? And so we started just getting the epi on it. And in fact, um, there is a gender gap and we did all these um, surveys and we found there was four main reasons for the gender gap, lack of mentorship, leadership opportunities for women who are working in um, low middle income countries, um, sexual harassment um, and sort of work-life balance and safety issues. And so we've developed this whole platform called the Women Global Health Research Initiative. And we now have over 300 women we're supporting through virtual and on-site um, activities. And we're and trying to just, you know, slowly make a difference. And capacity change, Victor has a, you know, is a leader in um, CBD training in low-income countries. It doesn't happen overnight. And you're not going to, you know, change the world with 300 trainees. But you take one and you 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 grow them over five, five six, seven years, and they become the ministry of minister of health in Tanzania. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. And I can't wait to tell you more, so you can do it here too. Uh, that was really terrific. Um, my question is: I'm I'm sure you're familiar with Michelle Albert's work on adversity and cardiovascular disease risk, and it seems like that's playing a huge role here, and that um, interventions around that mean identifying the primary. I mean, there's so much adversity here, right? But and then targeting strategies to reduce adversity. And it does seem like this community setting might be a way to do that. Have you thought about this, how you might tackle that? Yeah, we're just starting to think about it. And we need to learn from like best practices in the US. I will say we have a cushion to start, like we're not starting from ground zero because in the HIV world, we've built a lot of programs that span from, you know, micro, I mean, like it's all over the place, like microfinance to um, peer groups, to group-based care. Um, again, like, if you go to a leadership course, they say if you if you change the system by ten percent, you're making a difference. And so, you know, I think even like reducing it by ten percent that adversity can that translate into real health outcomes. Um, I think it's a fascinating area of work, though. And in global, we like come play. Like it, it, we need people to help to do. Right. It. it seems like just um, the epi around. Like what what are the real stressors in your life among all the dozens of stressors yeah and the, you know um we've run out of time here's what we built into the model i mean th this was a med student's idea by the way not mine um ah, sorry just oh this is painful here we go um here's what we could put in the model and it it's under review at jama cardiology i guess you know to say that out loud but th there you know, if you had a different cohort, you could put different adversity in it. And I'm not trying to say our adversity index is like, got it should be the gold standard. But I, I think it shows you that, well, first of all, um, this is not linear. So the, the it's, it's, it's almost like uh, sinusoidal that like, it's not just one thing you have to target. You almost have to target everything because synergistically they, they're not just additive is what I'm trying to say. Sorry, it took me a long time to get there. It's synergistic. Um, and so you have to look at the, the, the whole, sort of poverty adversity milieu. Uh, but these are the things that we included. Thank you so much, Maggie, for being here. Molly. And if anybody has any questions for Molly, please come down and she'll be here for a few more minutes. Thank you. <laughs>